discussing the modeling pros in discussing modeling process, I'm going to be um, discussing um, some model specification mechanisms um, within this course uh, that involve uh, some contrasts. Okay, um, the model building process is fundamentally a human process, just as the software development process is a is a is a human process. By a human process, what I mean is. To, to do it effectively, you have to understand the human element of it. You have to understand the human theater of modeling, just as you have to understand the human theater of software development. That's from a computer science background. When I say sort of the, the human theater of software development or human issues in software development, can anyone, can anyone sort of give me an example of considerations that come up in software development that have to do with taking into account human behavioral issues or concerns? What are some considerations we give to, to, to sort of the fact that we're dealing with, um, with, with people within software development? Everybody has different personalities, so you might have to deal with egos, different personal lives, different That's personal right. beliefs. Sometimes it's just hard to come to an agreement on things. That's right. So, so we have to navigate within the fact that uh, certain people tend to work often very well together, very good communicational styles that are compatible. Sometimes people have very different styles that aren't, aren't directly compatible and some measure of accommodation is needed maybe from, from both sides. Um, there's additional elements too. Morale turns out to be a huge thing in software development. People's morale is tightly linked to quality that they're, of, the, of the artifacts that they're producing. If they feel that they're not being given the time to produce quality products, if they're really worried about introducing bugs and they don't feel they have time to really thoroughly vet it, it's going to be hard to keep their morale high. And someone with poor morale tends to write more bugs, you know, introduce more bugs by accident. That, by the way, was just something that we could characterize with the causal evaluator. And we'll come back to that. There's a vicious cycle there that leads projects software projects to go south very quickly sometimes. But, soft, but um, as an aspect of building um, software artifacts, it turns out modeling has some, some similar issues associated with it. It turns out we're going to talk about uh, model specification of, of two, two types of, of models, uh, stock and flow models within this class and agent-based models. These are going to be our, our two primary sorts of models that we're dealing with. And it turns out that they differ in terms of their complexity. But I want to I want to go up here, and Neil, I've, I've skipped forward to to a slide entitled uh, ABM Model Process Overview. Okay, and um, this applies to the agent-based modeling process um, most particularly because I have some things in here with agent-based modeling. But the general stages here are common or in common, ladies and gentlemen, with um, with system dynamics modeling. And what are these stages? Um, problem conceptualization, qualitative problem mapping, model formulation, calibration, testing, policy evaluation, and knowledge translation. Okay. Now, we have um, a limited amount of time available right now. So what I'm going to do is to talk about this uh, more broadly. Okay. Those who are interested in more detail, I may spend some additional time on this next time, but I also have a bunch of materials where I go through this in quite some detail. Okay, But let's talk about this process. I, I introduced, ladies and gentlemen, the idea of models as a thinking tool, as a tool that captures our hypothesis for how, for how the world works, as it were, the way things work out there. And it's, it may be a best guess, or maybe one of our guesses. We may have competing models that we work with. And, um, and building those models, we do so in a staged way. So, so tell me, folks, from computer science background, what are the earliest stages of the software development process? What are some of the... Um, as, as it's sort of classically conceived of, what are some of the things you do earliest on when you're thinking about building a program? Requirements. You gather requirements. And broadly, we could talk about model conceptualization being sort of the gathering requirements phase of a system. Okay, Here, what we're trying to do is figure out 
what is the scope of the thing that we're trying to build? What is the, what's the extent to what we're trying to characterize? What is the research question or problem that we're trying to address? Just as in software, we ask about what's the need? What's the gap between what currently is and what could be that we're trying to fill with our requirements? Right? We're trying to fill with our system. And that helps us identify requirements. Right? Um, in, in the modeling area, um, sometimes we have patterns we want to explain. Sometimes we have patterns that distress us. Like the fact that chlamydia cases, cases came down for a number of years and now going up. That may distress us. And we say, you know, that's something we want to address. It's something we want to understand and we want to do something about. And here, we're setting the scope of what we're trying to do. Just as in software, we're setting the scope of this, this program. I mean, are, are, we, are we creating a software program that's going to you know, um, just um, count the, you know, number of occurrences of a word in some file? Or is it going to be something that's going to send, you know, um, a colony to the moon? I mean, there's a, a big difference. Um, and the scope has has a lot of impact on this, the scale of the product, product uh, what's needed, the scale of the process. So if someone is early on, we're doing conceptualization of a model. We're trying to understand what's in it. And there's three distinctions we make most closely, whether things are simulated within the system itself, whether they are represented but, but in a fixed sort of way, a predetermined way, or whether they're totally ignored, where ignored is consciously ignored. We know they could be important. We thought about them some, but we decided not to put them in there. And here, as in software, we typically start, we try to start on a smaller scale and incrementally build up the model. You incrementally build the model for the same reasons in software. It's less risky. It helps us gain feedback early from stakeholders and from others. It helps us reason about what's important and addressing the, delivering that value early on. It helps us keep focused on what we know will be needed rather than things we simply speculate um, are needed. And it helps us address risks early on by addressing technically or other risky things, politically risky things sometimes, so that we can get we can get a confidence about what is we need to do. So problem conceptualization is kind of like requirements. Problem mapping, qualitative problem mapping, um, is, is in some ways similar to what you see in software development with high-level design and architecting of a system. There, you might characterize using um, package diagrams and class diagrams. Um, you might use uh, high-level um, systems that depict, say, the model view controller decomposition of a system. Um, and, and you sort of map out at a high level who's talking to who, what's responsible for what. Here, what we're doing is we're characterizing at a qualitative level what what um, what's going on within uh, within the, the broader system um, and within this this model? So we're characterizing, for example, agents and their possible modes of interaction within our model. We're saying what 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 types of data do we need to keep track of these agents? You know, do we keep track of their hair color within the model, or are we just interested in their sex and age within the model? Or maybe we're only interested in their ethnicity and sex, and we're, we're even abstracting over age. So here we're going to be keep, keeping track of, you know, what what sorts of information do we need to keep track of in this model? In the stock and flow model, we're going to be asking about, uh, for example, um, how finely do we want to divide up um, the levels of infection? So for simulating flu, for example, um, I don't know if you folks know this, um, uh, but it turns out that um, when someone gets infected with flu, um, a common a common sort of rough situation is as follows. Uh, so roughly two or three days after that, um, they will often have developed enough um, virions in their body, virus particles. They've multiplied within the body fast and the immune system can suppress them. And they will be infective, but they haven't yet developed symptoms. 
So they will go around and do what's called asymptomatic shedding. They'll be shedding virus. You know, they'll be they'll be exposing other people to this virus. Um, and so maybe it's their family, maybe it's colleagues, maybe it's people in the class. Um, and uh, and then maybe a day or so later, they'll start to get start feeling really lousy. Symptoms will really come up in a big way, and those symptoms will last for a number of days. But partway through that time, where they're feeling really lousy and the symptoms are terrible, and they're blowing their nose and coughing and their body aches and fever, what have you. Partway through that time, they will have actually cleared the bug to the level the actual virus will be a low enough level they're not actually in danger of communicating someone not in danger of giving it to someone that flu um and then there'll be this phase where they the symptoms clear up and they're more or less immune for that particular strain or that particular sort of variant of flu um so if we build a model of flu infection and transmission we'll probably divide people into susceptible and we we obviously want to have some people that are communicating or transmitting it to others but do we represent people who are who are asymptomatic shedders, people, how about people that are exposed but not yet infectious? Or do we just kind of gloss over that? And we say, well, roughly, you're, you're susceptible, you're not yet infected, or you're infected and shedding and infecting other people and then you're recovered? Or do we break it up to much finer characterization? This is something we decide at that, uh, at that level. And we could decide that qualitatively. We could just kind of draw out. We also can use causal loop diagrams here. And we'll be seeing that in a big way. These are wonderful things. Causal loop diagrams are just tremendously powerful tools for eliciting from people who have never seen a simulation model, have never no interest in working with a simulation model, eliciting their understanding of the system. And it can be very insightful for characterizing phenomena you see around you. So in my time as a consultant, for example, in software development, I've, I've driven, drawn many causal loop diagrams characterizing dysfunction within projects or within companies. Because by drawing them, we can figure out where to intervene, for example. Okay, So we'll be seeing those quite a bit, probably in our next, next lecture. Um, model formulation, next lecture or two. Model formulation. Here what we're doing is we're specifying a model in a quantitative fashion. What do I mean by specifying in a quantitative fashion? In other words, we are giving enough detail so that we can simulate that model. Okay, And that involves going a lot beyond this qualitative stage. Just as building a software program, you've got to go beyond the architectural diagram stage and the you know, high-level class diagram. You, you need to actually write code. You have to put the code in, you have to set variables to certain values, and you know, populate a database that it depends on, whatever. That's model formulation stage. So here, here we have to quantitatively specify things at a much tighter level. And going from this stage to the model formulation stage often takes quite a bit of time. Okay? Going from a, a qualitative characterization to a quantitative characterization takes time. What do you get out of this? Well, you get a model that runs. Now, whether that model is meaningful is another matter. And so you've got to go through phases of model calibration and testing. And these two are sort of in an arbitrary order here. Um, but model testing often involves comparing the model against observed data, particularly data that wasn't told about when building it, that it that weren't wasn't presupposed when building the model, and testing it against how it behaves under a wide variety of circumstances. Um, just as in software development, we might plug extreme values in for certain inputs. So, so, <laughs> so some years ago, I, um, you know, I, I had since you just, they built this real-time pizza ordering system for my undergraduate software engineering class. It was called R RTPOS, um, and. Uh, and this uh, real-time POS, um, it, it, you know, they, they were supposed to produce a, a really hardened, robust piece of software. So they gave it to me. And, um, and so it said, you know, what pizza do you want to order? And it gave you a choice of, of, of pizzas. You could choose one. Okay, fine. I choose the vegetarian pizza or whatever. And, and, 
And uh, then it said, number you want to order. I said, you know, minus one. And, and I think it said they would give me, you know, $10 to order minus one um, because it said the cost is minus $10 or something like that. And, uh, and then, of course, I could, I could order, you know, 9999 or something. And, and it, it ended up flipping out. And um, I think it, it, it went into an infinite loop eventually or something like that. So um, it was not a effect, very effective system. And you don't want your model to behave really strangely um, under you know wide wide sets of parameter values either, and you check for consistency with units here. By a unit, I mean, um, for example, whether this variable measures persons or this variable measures dollars, this variable measures count of mosquitoes. So you don't try to do a Kafkaesque maneuver and turn a mosquito into a person, for example. Um, you know, add a count of mosquitoes to count of people. Um, uh, would not be a meaningful thing. In model calibration, here we're trying to match the model against observed results. Because here we put in estimates for particular model parameters in the model formulation stage. In model calibration stage, we often have lots of additional data on the overall behavior of the model in the real world, the overall system itself. And you try to, you try to make the model parameters that you don't know well enough Try to adjust them to best match that, that data you see in the world. And in a way, it's a little bit like regression, like non-parametric regression. Um, but uh, it's, it has some differences in terms of uh, the, the methodologies. Um, sometimes it uses some similar algorithms, so global, global optimization algorithms. So once a model is tested and you've secured calibration, um, go on to policy evaluation. I guess I should say with model testing, there's really two components. And I'm going to finish up with this slide because I know we've, we've got to go here. But for model testing, there's two components. One, ladies and gentlemen, is if they're all called V and V, who could tell me from software development? What are V and V? Because they come up in software too. V and V. It's not like bed and breakfast. It's V and V is validation and verification. Verification is... Well, validation I'll start with. That's the deeper ones. Have you built the right model? Is this the model you wanted to build? Given kind of what you're trying to describe, is this, does this meet your needs? Is this, is this sort of what you, what you were you know, really needed to address those questions? A separate question is, is um, and and by the way, uh, I should say with with validation, a, a big part of that is, is it consistent with what we see in the world? Maybe it's not. But if the model is not consistent with what we see in the world, is that a lost opportunity? Does that mean all our efforts were a failure? Let me put it another way. Why might I argue that if we see that our model is not consistent? Once we build it, we see that it's not consistent with certain observations in the world. Why might that be a cause for celebration, a cause for thinking it was actually a very good reason we built this model? Yes. Yes, you can, you, can, you can go, for example, check if that data source is really valid. Folks, some of the best modeling opportunities I've had in in, in life, some of the most enjoyable points were I have a model, it doesn't match up with the data that I get. People give me data and say, you know, here's the report of this or that. I match up the model to it, and it matches everything else but not that film. And I'm a bit worried that maybe it undercuts the model, but I go to them and I talk about this and they say, oh, that's right. That year where it stops matching, that's when we redefined this thing. So this data that we're giving you is actually using two different standards. So it's no surprise that during this from the period, from this period to that period, it doesn't match because the data definition was changed. So for data from that region, you should add in this additional factor to match it up. And I've been in several situations like that where actually it found problems with the data that were hidden from me that I didn't realize were there. So that's a cause for celebration. But another cause is, folks, 
because we had this hypothesis in the model in our heads and we didn't see the inconsistency. And the model helped us recognize that inconsistency. It helped us, in a word, to learn. It helped us learn about what is a consistent explanation. Maybe we found that that particular hyperdynamic hypothesis just doesn't jive with the data. Maybe after we investigate the data, we find it sound. And then we can look into other explanations. It helps us learn about how things work in the external world. This is one of the most valuable features of modeling, is to falsify our hypotheses, because that's how we advance. We make mistakes, and we learn from those mistakes quickly. How you advance in the world. OK, um, policy evaluation, once you get beyond this phase zone, you have a robust model, and often it involves some iteration here, because for this reason, some iteration between model formulation, model calibration, model testing. After that, ladies and gentlemen, is the fun phase of where you use it to give insight. What policy is more effective than what other policy? Under what conditions? Um, you know, what could we do better? Um, how could we improve this? This is where it's being used to provide policy insight. And often this is tied up with a knowledge translation phase, bringing that knowledge to those who need it um, by putting it into an environment where it's easy to use. Those from HCI background have a huge amount to contribute here. How do we package these models in a way that they're useful to a wide variety of stakeholders? How do we package them so that people who are not interested in the guts of the model, but what is going on inside of it, more interested in what it's saying happens over time under different policies, how can we provide environments that will let them pose their questions most effectively? An example would be the West Nile situation that uh, one year is working on. How do we build an environment for non-technical people that lets them see this sort of um, policy space over time and see how temper under different temperatures, different policies, temperature observations, different policies are better than others? That's a challenge, and that's a challenge that HCI can can inform. So we've run out of time here um, for today. Um, I will uh, have to uh, ask your um, um, ask your pardon um, for uh, having to uh, go through the material um, here uh, without without being able to broadcast it to Neil. Um, next time we'll try to make sure that that he can fully see my screen while I'm presenting. There's a there's a um, uh, thing here which uh, I'm not allowed to show my screen yet, and apparently someone has to flip a uh, switch so that I can do that. Um, what I will ask you to do is to go to the course website, the, um, uh, the Blackboard system, and log on there. You should see the link to Blackboard, and you should see a set of projects there. Those projects are all real projects with stakeholders. Um, at least one of the stakeholders is in the room here, Molly. Um, for, for work on a project related to sexually transmitted infections um, uh, for uh, health regions, uh, both local and down in Regina. Um, there's, um, there's a number of other projects there that have international stakeholders, people who really are seeking partners to examine these things. Those of you who are interested um, in some of, those, uh, some of those international projects, you may find you know, several papers come out of it. I know that um, some other students here work has gone gone on to be you know uh, paper quality. So so please be encouraged to think strongly about your projects and identify for me other projects. If you're not interested in taking on one of those, come talk with me about other projects. Okay, and I will see you then on Thursday, and hopefully we'll get this course uh, fully online for them. And Neil, um, why don't you send me um, mail? We'll see if we can. Uh, set up a time to talk about your experience and we can um, uh, we could try try experimenting a bit to make sure you can attend the next lecture okay um, see the slides oh okay okay that sounds good um, uh, so see if you can uh, get a hold of a mic for next time if, if you'd like to speak up great to have you here oh I should mention also I'll be posting all these recordings. Um, links to the website uh, for the recordings, and I'll further um, point you to a set of other uh, recordings that will be of help uh, in this course. Those those were on the mailing list when I sent out the uh, earlier information that people already have gotten that. 
but I'll see if I can post the link to the to the Blackboard site. Okay, so Thursday. Thanks very much.